Dr. Pedro, shall we start? You okay? I'm okay. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just uh, start. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon to all. Um, thanks for logging in uh, for this webinar, Eurodrug Laboratories. So without further ado, I will go straight into introducing our chairperson today. Uh, Dr. Patricia Lim is a consultant ONG who is graduated from uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education and uh, subsequently obtained her postgraduate degree uh, MRCOG from the Royal College of ONG about 10 years ago. So she's currently stationed at KPJ Tawaka Hospital, a private hospital in Kuala Lumpur, where she provides ONG related counseling. And also besides being an excellent obstetrician, she also provides expert, uh, expert care to those suffering from various gynecological problems such as heavy periods, endometriosis and menopause care. She is an avid, uh, she's an avid advocate of breastfeeding. Additionally, she is an official member of the board of various professional bodies, including the MMA, Malaysian Medical Association, OGSM, Obstetric and Gynecology Society of Malaysia, and member of the Royal College of ONGs. So uh, thank you very much all for, for logging in. Uh, I would just like to hand over to Dr. Lim uh, before that, just a very quick note. Uh, for those who have questions, uh, please write down in Q&A. There's a Q&A over here where you can uh, just, just type it in. Uh, the panelists, all of us, we will look through the questions and we will try to answer them later, right? Uh, Dr. Lim, over to you. Thank you, Kelvin, and thank you, Eurodrug. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Guten Morgen to Professor. Is it is in uh, morning in Germany. And um, a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us this afternoon. Um, it is indeed a privilege to be with you virtually. Although all of us are now in the midst of a pandemic, we are still in touch virtually. So I think this is a really good way to spend our Saturday afternoon. Today's uh, virtual conference is entitled Dinogest as the Modern Progestogen in Combined Oral Contraception. As we know, um, unplanned pregnancies is a uh, very important um, issue in, our, in many countries and unplanned pregnancies are associated with higher maternal morbidity and neonatal uh, mortality. Therefore, uh, the use of combined oral contraception or contraception alone is very important. And over the last five years, uh, years, uh, it has increased, uh, especially the use of COCPs in Southeast Asia. And so I think it is good as healthcare professionals to learn about the um, various OCPs that we have, especially now with Dinogest being in the market, and also to see the added benefits that many women really want besides contraception. So our speaker today is none other than Professor Pedro Antonio Regido. He is a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist, as well as has a subspecialty in gynecological endocrinology and reproductive medicine, as well as did his PhD uh, on endometriosis. He is a professor in, with the University of Duisburg Essen and has published many numerous papers and scientific articles in high impact journals. So without further ado, I think all of us are really excited to hear your talk today, Professor. So I welcome you to give your talk today. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much for, for, for this very, very nice introduction. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to, to, to share with, with you here in Malaysia. Now I'm in Germany. Uh, the, the ideas of what, what we can do with, with contraception especially with contraception containing Dinogest and also, also all the possible, as I would say, non-contraceptive benefits of these combined contraceptives. Thanks again. And now I will share my presentation. Um, one second, please. Always the same.
So while the professor is um, trying to share his slides for everybody who is watching, please uh, feel free to key in your questions at the Q&A box and we will try to answer as many as we can after Professor Pedro Antonio's uh, talk today. One second. I had this problem um, a few seconds ago. Um, so, yes, that's good. We can see this one slide. Yeah. So, um, digest. Um, before I start, a little bit uh, to the history of Dynagest. Dynagest was um, invented in Germany by a group of biochemistry people in, in, in the small town called Jena. And this was done in the year 1978. Uh, it's uh, for some of you maybe a very, very long time, but due to the political reasons of the Cold War, of the reunification, uh, this, this drug didn't find its way up to mid of the 90s. So even if it's uh, from the historical point of view, a very old drug, it has been introduced in, in Europe not so many years ago. And Dynagest has really changed in many aspects the need, the, the, the perception of what we have in contraception. Um, what can we say about Dynagest? Uh, Dynagest is um, a, a product that in the combined, in the combined situation has been now used by more than 10 million women years. Um, the first idea, and this was the, the basis idea, was to use it as a contraceptive. And I will not go move into the details, but, but uh, Dynagest is being used now far away more only than in contraception. Our, our theme today is this, the combination with atinyl estradiol 30 gamma in two milligram. And this is a clear combined oral contraceptive that has been approved by almost all European countries now more than 15 years ago. So it is the most prescribed COC in, in Germany. It is known, of course, for an excellent cycle control, for a good tolerability. And this is only, for example, one of the, the classical uh, possible non-contraceptive benefits, the use in, in acne. We know that it can be used in hormonal replacement treatment. There are formulations with this. We know that there are also formulations with estradiol, and we know that there are formulations as a monoformulation. So you see that the molecule has different aspects that can be used in different indications. So, um, what I want first uh, to describe is the pharmacology of Dynagest. Then I will describe the additional benefits as a contraceptive. I will not go into the details of contraception, as this is for me a supposed point. The pearl index of the combined pill with atinyl estradiol is 0 0.4, so a very, very high efficacy. As I told you, the non-contraceptive benefits, and to be very clear also, even if I know that this is not a topic in your countries, what is the most possibly, possibly challenging point, the thromboembolic risk. Starting with the pharmacology of Dynagest, we can see, and here I take uh, many, many aspects of my friend of Professor Mück, who has been one of the main investigators of this drug. You can see the Dynagest, if it's in theory a non-testosterone project team, it has many, many, many advantages of the pregnant. It is a hybrid. And you will see why this is interesting to be a hybrid, because it combines not testosterone positive effects 
with the progestogen positive effects, especially uh, if we look on MPA and made in cyproteron as the type and the partial side effects. If we look on the, on the structure, you see that this cyanometyl group, this makes a big, big change. And this cyanometyl group has, together with uh, the classical Seran formulation, first of all, and this is important, a high progestogenic Pedro? efficacy. Dr. Why will this... Dr. Pedro and Shudiko? Yes? Uh, I just want to let you know that your slides is not moving. It's uh, still in the first slide, which is the general oh. experience with Dinojes. It's not moving, so then we have a problem with the communication because I see it moving. Okay. Thank you to tell it to me. Um, I will do one second. Let me do it so. One moment. Yep. Maybe. For those who have logged in, thank you very much uh, for your time. Are you seeing uh, this now? Uh, no, it's actually still in the first slide. And now this, the third still? Yeah. So you see here the slide of pharmacology. Uh, the first, the, no, the slide I'm looking at now is a general experience with Dinoges. Mm -hmm. So then I will do the following. Can I suggest maybe if you maybe stop sharing and then try to share? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, no. I go. So I will try again. Uh, So, I hope you see now my first my first slide. Yes, uh, I'm now looking at your first slide. You have just changed to the second slide. Okay, so Dino Jess. And now to the third. No, I can't. I can't see your your third slide actually. Um, then I would suggest that I go out uh, and in again. I'm now looking at your first slide. Yes, and now the second. Now uh, moving into the second slide, yes. Are you seeing now the third slide? Yes, now the third slide, yes. Okay, and now the fourth slide. Yes. Okay, so I think we have we have solved the problems. Yes, thank you. Um, no, no, no. Excuse me that this didn't function. I was saying that um, I will start first um, with the pharmacology of Dynagest, and uh, Dynagest is a hybrid uh, progestogen, and that Dynagest is a progestogen that is a mixture of the not testosterone and of the progestogenes. And uh, in the slide before, I was citing Professor Mück, who is very, very highly involved in this complete trial programs. And he's one of the main, um, main, main, main uh, authors of all the publications that I will show you here now in the future. And, and the important thing of Dynagest is that as, as it is a, a hybrid, it has many, many advantages of the pregnant group, especially all uh, have positive side effects of medroxyprogesterone acetate, megastrol, and cyproterone acetate. 
and looking on the on the pharmacology, you will see that this uh, cyanometyl group here on on the end of the of the fifth uh, of the fourth like a uh, ring of the styran, this makes it the big, big difference to all other progestin genes. And therefore, Dynagest is unique. Of course, it has, and this was one of the main important uh, aspects during the chemical development problem, it has a very, very high progestogenic potency, being the drug from the progestin genes with the highest uterotrophic efficacy. So being a non-progestogen, uh, however, it, this special chemical structure leads to this unique beneficial FSQ spectrum. As, as I told you, it combines both groups, both groups of the progestogenes. And this is the only, only synthetical progestogen that has both aspects. And here you can see it again, that this is the special unique formulation from the chemical point of view. No other uh, progestogenes in all of this tree has the same situation. And this is important, not only in the use in contraception, but also in the use of other non-contraceptive situations. Dynagest, um, and this is a first interesting point, is very closely to the so-called natural progesterone, especially in respect to the binding proteins. Why I'm saying this? When we speak later on of possible uh, beneficial situations like polycystic ovarian syndrome or acne or hyzotismus, please do not forget that one of the main trigger aspects and, and the beneficial aspects of the combined is SHBG the sexual hormone binding globulin. Why? Because sexual hormone binding globulin is the protein that binds the free testosterone uh, and therefore has a very, very high potency to be anti-androgenic. As you can see, Dynagest does not bind to SHBG. So the amount of free SHBG is very high and this and answers SHBG to bind testosterone and have an anti-androgenetic partial efficacy. In comparison to levonorgestrel, uh, where levonorgestrel binds 50% to SHBG. So Dynagest is bound to albumin and Dynagest is not bound to SHBG. So very, very close and similar to progesterone. This is one of the first pharmacological big, big differences uh, that has Dynagest. And unlike other, uh, unlike other steroids, this manable binding makes it uh, a drug with a very, very high bioavailability. And if you see here that binding affinities uh, as they go down from the biological active dihydrotestosterone, please do not forget that testosterone is biologically fully inactive. We have to convert it via the 5-alpha reductase to dihydrotestosterone, and that these two are bound to SHBG. But if you look on other synthetic progestogenes like gestodame, levonorgestrel, norotestosterone, or uh, say um, 3 they have binding abilities up to 40%. Dynagest is almost zero. This is very important in the secondary activity of this drug and the combination. The next point is um, when I move to the steroid receptor activities of this hormone, we can see, and this is important, uh, I'm sure for your countries, that uh, the dynagest binds, this means binds directly to the androgen receptors. So we have big, big discussions. What is the ideal anti-androgenetic uh, gestogene? And this fully independent, fully independent of what happens with SHBG. And we have uh, to be very clear, four different group, four different drugs, clomadinone acetate, drosperinone, dynagest, and cyproterone acetate. As a molecule using this hashback test, this is a test also developed by Jena Farm in the 80s, 
uh, the highest affinity to the receptor to the receptor is cyclotiranacetide, and the second highest is Dinogest, with an efficacy of more than 40%, but this is only the molecule in its adherence to the testosterone receptor. So we have here the second aspect that it, it, even if it's a progesterone gene, uh, it binds uh, with a high affinity to testosterone receptors. And this one third of antiandrogenic activity uh, of, of cyprotiron in animal tests, this is very important, uh, shows us from the, from the historical point of view that this drug can be easily used comparing to CPA because in the clinical daily use in women and not in the animal tests, the anti-androgenetic partial activity of dinogest is even stronger, especially in the combination with atinyl estradiol. This is important. In the combination with atinyl estradiol, not in the combination with maybe estradiol or estradiol valerate, because almost, as I told you, no binding to SHVG. And this means that in the clinical, in the clinical daily use, the combination has even a higher anti-androgenetic partial activity than a combination with cyproterone acetate. This is a mixture of receptor binding and SHVG. Then we know, and this is important in gynecology, that uh, Dynogest is a very, very high specificity to the adherence to the progesterone receptor. We know that it has inherent anti-androgenic properties. We know, very important, no estrogenic, no androgenic, no mineral or corticoid positive or negative partial efficacies, and no glucocorticoid activity. So very, very neutral. And this is only the hormonal axis. I will show you that Dynatrest has a very, very important also anti-inflammatory aspect. And this uh, in the hormonal axis coming back, the endometrial activity is one of, I would say, the main targets of the efficacy of Dynatrest in the combination with atinyl estradiol. Why? We have uh, a so-called uterotropic uh, factor or autotropic uh, number. And this autotropic number, what you can see here, is the mixture of the ratio of the ovulation inhibition dosage and the transformation dosage per cycle. And you see that the autotropic index of dinogest is the highest by far, is by far the highest. And this means that the positive efficacy of dinogest on the endometrium is very, very high. So that women using dinogest in a combination with, and this is important again, etinyl estradiol, not estradiol, not estradiol valerate, in the combination with etinyl estradiol, the amount of spotting, the amount of unscheduled bleeding is absolutely very, very low. And this is very important to create a satisfaction uh, in regard to the cycle control under the use. And if we are using this in a classical, let us say, 21 and 7 day regime, we will achieve a 98 to 99 percentage of scheduled bleeding without any unscheduled bleeding. And this is due to this inherent, highly adaptance of the molecule to the receptor of progesterone in the endometrium. No other uh, synthetic uh, progestogen, chloromadinone uh, acetate, cyproterone acetate, what you, what you want. No other has this efficacy. And this is the reason why this combination drug is very often used in patients with, for example, endometriosis and dysmenorrhea. And here you have also clear uh, the, the idea of dynogest as a progestogen for the treatment in endometriosis. But this is a complete other aspect that I will reach later. Ovarian activity. <clears throat> this is now clear that we have to focus a little bit if this drug really inhibits the ovulation and at what dosage. Why? Because uh, during the whole clinical trial projects, 
uh, different dosages were, uh, were experienced. At the beginning, people were using one milligram, then two, then three. And I, for myself, did a clinical study with 20 milligram of Dinogest. The ideal dosage was found to be two milligram. Why? Because two milligram is the ideal situation for the inhibition of ovulation independent of the peripheral effects of thickening the cervical mucus, of making a transformation of the endometrium to a, what we say secretory transformation without proliferation. So you can see here that with a two milligram, absolutely no ovulation was found. But interestingly, one milligram, um, nobody is, is, is selling this with one milligram. One milligram would be enough to have a good ovulation. Not the optimal, but this is a reason two milligram was found. Um, and this is clipping published by clipping, but uh, Professor Otto, he is the developer of, of Dinogest found this in the, in, the, in the 80s. So two milligram is the ideal dose, but what has this two milligram as a, another positive side effect? We know that very often, um, com, even also the combine are associated with very low estradiol values of the women. And um, here you see that if we use 0 0.5 milligram or one milligram continuously, 80 picogram per milliliter on estradiol was found in the blood of the users. So 80 milligram is something like the pre ovulatory phase. But interesting, if we use two or three milligram, we are reaching estradiol values of 30 to 40. And this is good because this is the own estradiol value of the woman, and this shows that we have on one side an inhibition of LH of FSH, but uh, during the rest of the cycle, uh, the, uh, the inhibition of FSH is relatively low, and this is good to maintain appropriate estradiol values, independent of the biological activity of the 0 0.03 milligram of etinyl estradiol. So with this two milligram, the, the amount of own of inherent estradiol values is very good. And this is always a positive situation for the users. And saying this, um, the authorization was given uh, in, in the European Union uh, since uh, beginning of the, uh, since beginning of 2000. And as I told you, the pearl index is 0 0.4, but we know that we have a lot of extra genital activity. The first thing, very important, this is a little bit the aspect of the possible side effects. No relevant hepatic effects. Um, in comparison to other progestogenes, genes, let us say, for example, cyproteron acetate, we know that cyproteron acetate can create liver adenomas. We know that, for example, we have, with the use of Dynagest, no relevant vascular effects. This is important because Dynagest has no estrogenic and no anti-estrogenic effect. So all progestogenes, this is the nature of progestogenes, have an anti-estrogenic effect. Dynagest is the only one that's neutral. And why can we say that this is also neutral in, in, the, in the clinical practice? I told you at the beginning that the molecule is being used in different combinations. It's been used in contraception with estradiol valerate. It's been used in contraception with etinyl estradiol, but it is used also um, in, the, in the hormonal replacement tr treatment. And here important is to have no damage on the vascular side. And this is a, a very interesting study of, from my colleague, Professor Mook, where he could show that measuring nitric oxide, uh, and nitric oxide is one of the strongest vasodilatators, we have, due to the use of dinogest, no significant difference between estradiovalerate and estradiovalerate and dinogest. So dinogest does not reduce uh, the positive effects of estradiol. And this is the only progestogen that has this neutral effect on the estrogen side axis. 
we have that we know that um, even in the in the mono substance we have no changes in the lipid metabolism here there are very interesting studies comparing it to to NETA, <clears throat> where you can see that hdl and ldl this means the triglycerates uh, are negatively negatively uh, balanced by NETA, and dinogest does not negatively impact we have no impact on the glucose we have no impact on the liver enzymes we have as all and this is a very very important aspect here in the mono substance no impact on the hemophysiological parameters and also on the adrenal and thyroid gland metabolism so we have a drug that's really a very very um mutual and as i told you we even in did in, in my university the studies with dosages up to 20 milligram they never went into the daily use but there was the idea that 20 milligram would be better in the improvement of some conditions going to the pharmacology and now <clears throat> going to to the contraception um very easily we can say that this is a, I will translate this is in German, the serum progesterone values go down very, very fast and soon. So this is one of the first, uh, first uh, studies, uh, phase one, on the development in the contraception, in the use with DML. And you can see that the progesterone values went down in the first cycle at values of uh, 0.5, <clears throat> nanomol per milliliter so highly efficacy and path to starting so that in in real life use if a woman starts with with a drug in the first or second day of the menstrual cycle they have in this first cycle a reliable contraception and do not need any additional contraceptive um, systems and on the other side <clears throat> they're very very often stated question is what happens after the use of the combined pill in the sense of when does a woman return to fertility um, many many people even today think that contraceptives um, the combined especially are uh, a negative drug in the sense of returning to fertility here you see a study done by Perez Campos that the occurrence of pregnancy within the first 13 cycles after discontinuation was even was even higher than without the use of a combined. So you see the amount of women that returns very, very fast uh, to, to fertility. And this is due to the fact that the bioavailability is high and also the metabolization. So there is no risk. This is a very important, no risk on the side of inhibition of fertility. And this, uh, this made it very, very clear that we always try to, 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 to see what happens with the acceptability of the drug. And you see that the overall subjective tolerability in two uh, cycle groups, cycle one to three and four to six, in this very, very, um, uh, high amount uh, cycles uh, study done by Perez Campos shows that almost 80% of the women were highly satisfied or very satisfied with the use of the drug. And this uh, is the basis that the DNA uh, then in, in, in real life in the practice um, was used more and more in other conditions. And this makes it so that in Europe, in many, in many countries, um, the, the ethanyl estradiol containing um, drug has not only the official, I would say, of the, the official indication for the contraception, but has also the official indication of another point that's acne. But first of all, important is to prevent pregnancy because the reduction of unintended pregnancy is of course a reduction in abortions and in extraterrestrial pregnancy. This is one of the points that we sometimes forget. Contraception um, is, is, is important to reduce unintended pregnancies and all the associated side effects of unintended pregnancies. In many, many countries, the mortality 
of uh, abortions, legal or not legal, is very, very high. And then from the non-contraceptive benefits, please uh, don't be, um, don't be a little bit angry with me because this is only an extract. So cycle disturbances, dysmenorrhea, anemia, we are still fighting for changing the values of anemia between men and women because women have always one to two points less uh, hemoglobin than men. And this is due to the heavy menstrual bleedings. We know acne, we know all the situations of pelvic inflammatory situations, rheumatoid arthritis, banning bias diseases, of course, all the problems with follicle cysts. We know, and this is clear, that we reduce with the use of COC the rates of ovarian cancers, endometrial cancers, colon cancers. And here, I'm, I'm, I, I, I will not put it in because I will speak a lot of it, poly, uh, also the, the impact on the PCOS. You see all these points, and I will now focus, uh, but we can discuss more other things, on, on two aspects that are relevant from the banner side. First, because it is in what we say our leaflet, because it is in our legal situation of the use, what does not mean that it can be used for other things, is dynogest and acne. And I go back, I go back to the Hirschberg test. The Hirschberg test shows us that clinically, Dynogest is even stronger than the combination of uh, ethanyl estradiol with um, cyproteranacetate. Why? Because if I want to treat acne, I have to, I have to think in two, two axes. I have to use an antagonistic effect on the androgen receptor, and I have to influence SHBG. These are the both parameters for having a drug for reducing the biological actively DHT. So we have to reduce your testosterone. And we have to also consider, and these are clearly um, <clears throat> ethnical differences, that the number of androgen receptors is different in the populations of Asia, of Europe, of Africa. This is very important, and not only the number, but the ability of these receptors to create a signal of androgen promoting genes. This is very important because one thing is to have the receptors, and the second thing is to have the post-receptor changes. And clearly, we have to, to have in mind this pathway testosterone, DHA, androstenedio, DHA. So, in, in, the, in the situation of the acne, we know that we have uh, a highly uh, androgen-dependent uh, sebaceous gland in the face, in the skin over the breast, in the upper back. We know that seborrhea is the problem, that seborrhea with the sebaceous glands create these comedones, and these comedones create an inflammation, the inflammation in the papules, the papules are pustules, and then we have what we see as acne. And this is a cycle, a cycle viciosus that many dermatologists first try to treat with antibiotics. It's clear. If I have here my comedones, if I have here my inflammation with skin bacteria, this can be an approach. But the, the main target problem is the hyperproduction of dihydrotestosterone. And this dihydrotestosterone creates a hyperplasia, and this creates a seborrhea, and then I have my papers. So if I start on this axis, the probability of improving is higher than by using uh, um, um, an antibiotics. And the same holds on for hyacetismus. Hyacetismus is a clearly problem that you can see here in these pictures also, and this is very, very more important uh, here in the, in the second part, in the woman with a polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a classical sign that we also use as the parameter for the improvement. Here we have different aspects. This is what men feel when they have too much locally androgens that they have the hair loss, but this is a devastating situation for women. And the problem is that we have here, due to the hyperandrogenism, this uh, sebaceous gland formation, 
that creates what we see here, this acne papulopostulosa. And this is a reason why a uh, combination is important. Liver specific transport proteins, as I told you, play a super important role. And this is the reason why we have to use atenyl estradiol. If we think to manage acne, uh, atenyl estradiol is the very important part as it rises up SHBG five to 600 times. As I told you, if SHBG goes up, the free testosterone goes down. And this is the reason why COC have the main important uh, drugs in the management of anti-androgen effect. And this is supported by the progestogene. So conjugated estrogens or estradiol or now with the new estrogen, estradiol, will not have a use in this situation. Again, SHBG is a transport protein for the androgens and only the free not bound hormones are biologically active. And this is important um, that, for example, as I told you, Dinogest does not bind to SHBG. And you have to know that we are speaking here of very, very low amounts. Only 1% of the testosterone is free because testosterone is bound also to SHBG. If I raise up testosterone, I will bind more testosterone. And the difference between a man and a woman is one to three percent. You see, men have two to five, four percent free testosterone, uh, not more. Uh, men think that, are, that they are testosterone bombs. That's not the case because uh, the, the, the biological active is, is not so high. But this is the point why I'm saying that DNH reduces the androgenic effects. This is very, very important. Saying this, we have the, 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 the very, very, very uh, important uh, situation. The Dynages has this very low binding capacity as it reduces free and the combination makes it a special drug. And to be now short, what happens in real life? This is one of the biggest, of the hugest studies with a high amount of women using the combination of 0 0.03 and 2 uh, milligram. And you see in the study that the reduction not only of the, uh, of the mild and moderate acne was significant, but also of the severe acne. So you see that we have an improvement and a healing uh, that is highly significant under the use of this combination in more than 2,000 women in the mild situation, more than 2,800 women in the moderate situation, and even 1,000 women in the severe situation of acne. So this was also the reason why <clears throat> it is an official drug for the management of acne in all the countries of Europe. The, this, this is the only drug that has a twofold combination, so contraception and treatment of a disease. Going to a similar but different aspect that affects a lot of women, what happens when we use Dynagest EE and uh, we have women with a PCOS? You know that the PCOS uh, was first described by two surgeons, not gynecologists, these two guys were Americans <clears throat> and they simply made what we said, this, uh, this excision of the ovaries uh, during uh, this excision of the part of the ovaries. And then they saw, wow, uh, I'm an array woman, get, an, uh, get a bleeding. We know that PCOS is difficult to classify correctly. We have an under-representation of women and an over-representation. Why? Because this Rotterdam classification is still the, the, the Legia Artist classification. And for me, it is too soft in the sense that uh, we don't have really hard facts to define which woman is a woman that has a PCO. We have to have a classical PCO uh, ultrasound image or we have to have a woman with oligoamenorrhea and a woman with hyperandrogenismus. Two of these three aspects 
must fit to say that a woman has a PCOS. But even if up to 15% of all the women during their reproductive life have a PCOS, we still have no possible cure. So we only can treat the symptoms and we can treat the problems um, in different ways. And, and one of the important, uh, I would say, segregation is uh, the child wish. If a woman has or not a child wish will determine the way the, of the approach uh, of the management of PCOS. Why? Now, for all the women that don't have a child wish, this is very important, um, the, the, the old, I'm saying now the old approach was a hormonal approach. A hormonal approach to trying to reduce testosterone. The second approach is the approach to, uh, to focus on the insulin resistance. It's important. 85% of women with PCO have an insulin resistance, even if it's not a criterion of the Rotterdam classification. But for me, the hormonally speaking, most important. Why? These women develop insulin resistance and nobody really knows why. This is the main problem. But what makes this happen? This insulin resistance decreases SHBG. If I decrease SHBG, I enhance, I raise up the biological available testosterone. Insulin resistance has a positive effect, a positive effect on the production of the ovarian androgens and the adrenal androgens. And then it has a positive effect on the LH release that on the other side, again, enhances the ovarian androgens. So this is my blockbuster, the insulin resistance that creates the problems. What can I do? I, first of all, to be very clear also, all, all COC, independent of the sort of the progestogen used in the COC will have a positive impact on PCOS women. First, as they will reduce LH secretion, the amplitude and frequency. If I block LH, I will block the, android, the ovarian androgens. Second, all have a direct, all COC, have more or less a direct effect on the ovarian androgens. Saying this, those containing, those containing Dynagest and those containing Cyproteron acetate have a higher direct impact on the ovarian androgens. The third aspect is that all COC, of course, have an impact on SHBG. But as I told you, now the change goes to, the, to those who have, of course, uh, no binding and no binding to SHBG. So we now start with saying all can have an impact. We reduce it on the androgen axis, and then we reduce it again on the axis of the SHBG binding. We are deselecting, as I would say, COC. And last but not least, all those containing this anti-androgen progestogens block, block on the axis of the receptor. So this means that in theory, we can use all COC, but in practice, we should use only those containing a high amount, so high, it's relative, of course, 0 0.03 milligram of atenyl estradiol in combination with a progestogen that has anti-androgenic partial efficacy. And this is the important reason why then I can reduce the androgens and then I reduce the insulin resistance. It is known that by reducing androgens, I reduce insulin resistance. This is independent of the weight of the patient. This is the hormonal axis of attacking the PCO. But we know that PCO <clears throat> is not only a hormonal dependent disease, we know that PCO is a chronic inflammation. And this uh, chronic inflammation in women with PCO has, is gaining more and more importance in the last years. Why? Because we have here three, again, three parameters, the insulin resistance with a hyperinsulinemia, then the hyperandrogenism, and in Europe, 85% of PCO women have obesity. 
And all these three parameters, the androgens, the overweight, and the insulin, create a chronic inflammation, especially in the gut. And this is the reason why now we know that we have to act with drugs that attack on both sides. And this is the reason why Dynogest is from the hormonal point of view, independent of other, other treatment options like insulin um, resistant deblocking situations like metformin, for example, or rhinocetols, or if I treat with omega-3 fatty acids, for example. But if I treat hormonally to make the combination of everything, I have to use Dianogest because Dianogest is the only drug again, the only, and this is an inherent situation that shows the down regulation of prostaglandin E2 that has a positive effect on the down regulation of cytokines you know, in our COVID times, we have the problem with the cytokine storm. We know that IL-6, IL-X, and the monoactive uh, hemoactive protein is reduced. And also we have a positive impact on the neovascularization. So it's, it's an inhibition of vascular endotelial growth factor, for example. And this is, and again, a unique feature that, for example, cyproteron acetate or even other synthetic progestogenes do not have. So in this case, it is absolutely clear that, uh, that from the treatment option, from the treatment option in the hormonal way, a combination of Dynagest and uh, ethanyl estradiol is a positive drug for the management of PCO. And even knowing that in your countries, but it's important that you that you that you understand our problems that we have in Europe with what with this blockbuster point venous thrombolytic effects. I know that this is different uh, in your countries, but one thing we forgot always in the sense of PCOS. PCOS women, independent, completely independent of the weight, have a two point fold higher risk of developing a thrombosis. And one of the reasons is this pro-inflammatory action. And we know that one factor, the so-called thromboxanes, are highly expressed in PCOS women. And this is the reason why PCOS women, due to their disease, are at high risk to develop a thrombosis. And then if you see here the famous data of Vina Godrova also also republished by Lidegard, you see that the combination of COC with cyproteron are, are of the highest thrombolytic risk. This is another point, and this will be the last part of my, of my discussion, the, the side effect of thrombolytic, just to, to be very clear and present this data. If we are thinking um, in the management of non-contraceptive benefits, and now, and again, in the situation of the PCOS woman, we have to think very, very, very clear about the so-called long cycle regimes. You know that the classical regime formulation of, of the anil, for example, is the 21-7. So the idea is to induce this scheduled bleeding due to the seven days of free of hormones. If a woman has dysmenorrhea, if a woman has a PCOS, Please think about long cycle. So this means simply skip the seven free days and give it, give it continuously because you will then induce an amenorrhea. I know if a woman doesn't like to have an amenorrhea, you cannot use this long cycle regime. But from the treatment, from the treatment aspect, the continuous regime has a higher efficacy than the conventional cyclic treatment regime. Now only thinking in the management of PCOS, of dysmenorrhea and of acne, for example. And uh, as the woman have a 30 gamma and as the woman have dynogest, the probability of developing sprockiness or of developing unscheduled bleeding in the month four, five, six, is obviously low. It's not zero, but low. But in the, in the management of diseases, please think in the use of the long cycle. And now in my last part, um, just to, to present the data, it's important to know 
that the European Medicine Agency is highly focused on thromboembolic events uh, when CHC, this means the, all the hormonal combined or the COC are used. This is in, in Europe a blockbusting system because um, the, the key driver, so that you have an impression of what happens in Europe, the key driver of prescribing a COC or CHC is the thromboembolic risk or not. So one important thing is I want to present uh, epidemiological data. These are for me probably the most important of what is happening in real life. And here there is a com com um, comparison between combined COC using drospirinone, Dynogest, and or levonorgestrel. Uh, this is a group of Dinger and I that published this, this uh, highly epidemiological data. What do they see? First of all, we have to know that COC users, independent of what they use, have an odds ratio of 2.3 higher of developing a thrombosis than non-users. This in European populations, it's important. But what they could see that the use of EE, drosperinone, and dinogest versus other COC does not increase the risk uh, of thromboembolic. So, uh, of thromboembolic cases. <clears throat> so, in epidemiological databases, um, dinogest is as safe as drosperinone as other COC. And this is a very plastic uh, picture showing the additional VTE risk during the use of COC and here with uh, the woman with art. You see, this is the, the three to four women under this case, this was uh, 29,000 women years and we have an increase, this is correct. And if we are counseling, we should at least say that this is a possible risk that can occur due to the use of COC. And then we have to be also very clear on this uh, axis of the thrombosis. The only bad guy is the estrogen. The progestogenes per se don't raise up the risk of thromboembolic events. <clears throat> and here you see uh, in, in many labelings uh, uh, in the world, you see this comparator table. You see that one to five cases are occurring in nature in non-pregnant women. Uh, that are in the reproductive age that don't use hormones, that goes up to three to 10 cases. We know that the pregnancy and the postpartum phases are a situation where the women are exposed to a high endogenous estradiol values. And this is a reason why they are also exposed to a higher thromboembolic risk. Coming to my conclusion, uh, I simply want to, to focus on the inherent characteristics that were described by Oettel and Mück. These are the two, I would say, Germans that mostly uh, de developed and um, <clears throat> precisely explained this, this, this molecule. And therefore, in, in Europe, uh, many people say this is a very German molecule. It is correct because the Germans were the ones who, who developed this, also drosperinone. Um, but uh, you see, we have from the biological point, from the, no, not from, from the chemical point, not the biological point, we have a relatively low antigonotrotopic effect. So still some ovarian E2 production. This is very good. We have no accumulation, a very short plasma half-life of 11 hours. We have a very, very strong progestinational effect on the endometrium with a very, very low amount of bleeding problems. Of course, we have this anti-androgen activity. We have this anti-inflammatory activity. We have uh, no further increase in the risk of with combined EE. We have a high tolerability, no interaction with specific transport proteins, especially SHBG. We, it's neutral in the metabolic, in the vascular, in the hepatic effects, also in the central nervous effects. And very important, as it's neutral to the estrogens, no negative side effects on bone, on the cardiovascular system, and on the central nervous system. 
and an excellent clinical uh, stability, especially uh, uh, for, for the endometrium efficacy, effective in the treatment of dysmenorrhea, then please use it in the long cycle. No negative aspects uh, on the fertility regaining after stopping with the COC and clearly uh, a highly improvement in, in women with PCOS, a highly acceptance already used in more than 10 millions of women of women. So the amount of cycles is impressively high and a VTE risk that's comparable to other COC. This is in summary uh, what this drug can, can present uh, from the contraceptive axis and from the non-contraceptive axis. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, Professor Regidon. That was a very interesting um, talk and I hope everybody uh, was uh, paying close attention to all the new information or at least updates to the uh, latest use of Dinogest as the modern progestogen in combined oral contraception. So we actually have some questions and uh, Professor, are you ready to take some of the questions? Yes, yes, of course, one second. I'm only moving because I have to use uh, here. Do you see? So, of course, yes. Okay, what is the youngest age? Uh, can I start uh, this? Dinogest as a modern progestogen in a COC, and what is the oldest age to stop? Um, from the um, from the medical point of view, um, after Menage, you can start to use, and well, to see it's so a Menage to menopause, very easy. All so right. during during the whole reproductive life, um, one point could be. The very, very young ladies, because sometimes um, some, some people are thinking what happens to the bone development. Um, as we have um, atenyl estradiol, um, we have obviously, if we would use it in very, very young adolescents, let us say 13 or 14 year old adolescents, it has no negative impact on the bone. Okay, and, that's good uh, and up to uh, up to menopause. All right, so we answered that question. The second question is from a Dr. Ling Ling who um, has a patient who is on Danielle, which is the Dinogest COC, and uh, for a few months complaining of breakthrough bleeding roughly twice a month in the menstrual cycle. In the previous months, she actually had no issues. She's compliant. She didn't miss any pills and is taking it at the same time every day. So she wants to know what's the reason behind and what can we do to address this problem? So if organically, and I suppose that this is the case, everything is okay. So no myoma, no polyp, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes um, the uterotropic efficacy of the dinogest is not able to reduce uh, the mid-cycle spotting. In this case, I would suggest that uh, the woman should use it continuously without a break of the seven days uh, for three or four months. And then she will probably be amenorrheic, so she will not have the, the scattered bleeding. If she still would have uh, mid-cycle bleeding problems, the next, the next help would be to, in these days, to give two tablets. So for these four to five days, um, she will have these problems also with any other COC. But first I would say long cycle, and second I would say to raise up for four days the tablet used to, to the double dose. Okay, so um, do not leave the seven day gap. That's one option, give her a longer cycle. Yes. And the second one is to double up just for four or five days. Yes. Okay, that's good. The third question that we have today, Professor, is would you recommend giving Dinogest to patients solely for acne purposes? 
Um, mm, yes, it can be done, of course, clearly. Um, important is, uh, this is one thing that's very important, and, and, I know, and I'm a little bit coming from Europe. Please uh, counsel the woman correctly to the side effects. Counsel the woman to, to the thromboembolic risk. And then I, of course, would, would give it, um, as there are clinical studies, as there are clinical data, and um, and um, and and answer is yes. But okay. but saying clearly, uh, these are the possible risk. Like like uh, the dermatologist should also say, if I use an antibiotic, I can get an allergic reaction. Okay, it's important to know that we we have to know this balance. But from the hormonal point, yes. All right. Okay. Um, coming back to the question before this, Prof, uh, did you mention doubling up if there is some breakthrough bleeding? Um, so if we double up the tablets, then the lady will be um, short at the end. Does she just continue a next packet, or would yes, she? Yes, I would. But but this is the the second uh, the second point. Okay, <clears throat> if a woman has a problem with mid cycle bleeding, the first thing I would do is long cycle. And if after the long cycle, so after three to six cycles, she still has the problem, <clears throat> then I would do the second way. Okay, all right, got that. Uh, there is another, another question from um, Dr. Harun Hussein, who wants to know how fast can a patient resume her fertile period following the discontinuation of Dinoges? And is this dependent on her BMI? How fast can she? Can she resume her fertile period? Can she re get pregnant? Yeah. Uh, um, this can be very, very soon. Um, the point is the half-life of Dynagis is a small one. Um, and um, this is also the reason why we're using two milligram and not one milligram. Uh, because as a half-life is short, uh, now you, I have to change my mentality. Uh, it must be good to inhibit the ovulation. And when they were using the one milligram in the first phase one studies, they saw some ovulations due to the short half-life. And the second point is that we have the seven-day pause. So this is a reason to give two milligram. The half-life is 11 hours. The return to fertility can even be after day 15 to 20 after finishing with the package. And in real life, almost 90% return to fertility in three months after finishing. And if I have a woman with a high BMI, we did not find any significant differences between BMI and return to fertility after the use. So we have also not um, accumulation in the fat tissue. That's good to hear. So we can confident, confidently uh, counsel the patient that she will re get her uh, fertility resumption right um, almost Very soon. Immediately. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. If a lady has issues with bleeding with drosperidone or cyproteron, would you then recommend the switch to Dinoges? Um, honestly, first, it depends on, on what is the bleeding problem. Um, um, this, this is um, saying it neutral. Um, also, again, first, if there is no organic uh, problem, and if, if it depends, if let us say an example, spottings, it depends uh, in the case of Dynages, uh, of Drosperinone, if they're using a 20 or a 30 gamma. Let us say a 30 gamma. And let us say the same for, for cyproteron and to make it simple. If we have a 30, 30, 30, then the advantage of Dynagest is compared to Drosperinone and to cyproteron that this uterotrophic index is the highest. The transformation, uh, in a, in a, we say, in a secretoric, non proliferative endometrium is the highest. And there are women that don't bleed even if they're doing a seven day break. It's a very small group, but this is due to the high potency of dinogest on the endometrium. Okay. So it's of course worthy 
to do this if um, if the woman is using a 30 or in the case of Di of Cyprotron, it will be Diana or it's generics. Uh, in this case, it's 35. But this is due to the fact that whether Cyprotron or Cytite, no, Drosperinone has this uterotropic efficacy. So that's the added benefits, yeah. Okay. Yes. If a PCOS patient is obese, is it enough to use one tablet a day for an obese patient or do we need to adjust the dose to increase it to get um, this effect? Um, from the, again, different aspects. Um, if I want also to prevent the pregnancy, it's not needed to use two tablets. Um, if I want to impact on the PCOS, okay, uh, also, two tablets would not be um, an additional help. In this case, in this case, and this is important, I would add another treatment option, like, for example, an insulin sensitizer or like an omega-3. Add, this means to do a combination. And of course, very, very important, in theory, to counsel the woman to lose the weight. I know, theory and praxis. Uh, are two different things. But uh, for obese women, uh, I would combine it, for example, with inositol or with an omega-3 fatty acid. Okay. And important, uh, clearly, all these women that have no child wish, things are changing if they have a child wish. All right. Um, there is a question on the, um, what is the role of using a Dinoges COC for endometriosis? Yes, um, this can be done. This is on um, a very, very classical question, very often asked. <clears throat> in, the, in the guidelines in most European countries, um, we have the idea that if we have the suspicious of endometriosis, we have to make a segregation between my moderate and severe. And uh, the use in the mild and moderate uh, the metriosis patients, severity scores, especially dysmenorrhea, is highly accepted with a COC. And then please use it continuously. Of course, we can think what happens if this doesn't work. Then we can switch to an estrogen free product. Independent, and then we can think if we are using a progestogene only pill or if we are using uh, the monogestogene formulations as a two milligram mono dinogest that's approved for the treatment of endometriosis or even didrogesterone or, or others. But <coughs> normally, uh, for the mild and moderate um, situations, uh, many start with a combined. We can also start with an estrogen-free POP. Both things are possible, but what we intend is to create an amenorrhea. All right, that's good. There is another question about PCOS. I think this is quite a hot topic here in Malaysia. Um, many patients get diagnosed as PCOS from a particular doctor, and they will usually um, try to seek some second opinion. Um, the question is, um, does PCOS ever get treated, or is it just a disease that we can control? Um, <clears throat> no, we, we cannot. The problem is we, can, we don't know the origin, the pathophysiological origin of PCOS. We know that we have this insulin resistance. We know that we have the hyperproduction of LH, and this leads to a hypertestosteronemia, and this leads to a chronic inflammation. And I think in, in, in your countries, the group, this is important. Now we have to segregate between obese and non-obese PCO women. Um, to say it so, <coughs> the obese PCO women is in theory easier to treat because we in theory know more pathophysiology. Uh, nevertheless, the non-obese we know that they are, have a higher sensitivity to insulin or LH, even if the values are normal, because the post-receptor translational activity is higher. And we cannot 
treat the basis of the disease, but we can treat the symptoms. And for the obese woman, even if it's hard to say, the, the most efficacious uh, treatment option is the weight reduction. And, uh, and, and I know theory and praxis, yes, but uh, probably on the obese women, I would combine, I would combine a mixture of, of different situations uh, of a hormonal treatment, maybe with an anti-inflammatory compound, maybe with an inositol or metformin. Um, inositol and metformin probably I would not use in the lean woman. So it's, uh, uh, we have to really individualize the situation, but the COC containing uh, Dynagest can of course be of a very, very useful help. Okay, thank you. A couple more questions. Uh, what is your recommendation for a patient who got pregnant while on um, Dynagest COC? That she got pregnant even using this? Yes. Well, um, then we will have to, to analyze why she got pregnant. Uh, the, the Pearl Index is 0 0.4. So this means four pregnancies under 1,000 women that have used correctly the drug. Um, normally, um, without knowing this individual case, uh, the, the highest amount of pregnancies under the use of COC are the mispills. pills. So if a woman has a problem with the daily intake of a tablet, and uh, then I would change the system. Uh, I would move to a vaginal ring or a patch or an IUD. Okay. Uh, it is clear that 25% of women forget <clears throat> at least one tablet per cycle. Yes. And this is a point. And we know that 12 to 20% forget two tablets. Exactly. And one, uh, before I forget, this is, uh, and the third point is to recommend the long cycle. The, the risk of the 21-7 system, the 21-7 the system allows us to have a breakthrough bleeding. If the woman forgets it on the day 21 and on the day one of the following cycle, the window is nine days. And this makes it more risky to get pregnant. The long cycle reduces uh, the pregnancy risk. Okay. The same uh, person just has a continuation to the question. Is it safe for her to continue her pregnancy? If, if, it, if the woman is pregnant? No, I don't understand the question. So she fell pregnant while taking Dynogest COCP. Yes. Yes, can she, she continue? Yes. yes, yes, she felt pregnant, yes. Um, this can be due, some women claim, um, this is a, a very rare but side effect, they claim a sort of breast tenderness. So uh, can she, is it safe for her to continue the pregnancy? Yes. I don't think there's any issues, right? No, there's no issue, but, but uh, from, from the pregnancy point of view, uh, okay, now I understand. No, there is no, <clears throat> there are no teratogenic, um, no teratogenic um, uh, known side effects of Dynagest. Uh, and ethinyl estradiol will also not be a problem. Uh, so this is, uh, the woman should, of course, stop the use. Uh, but uh, the mono substance using Dynagest mono can be used even for the maintenance of the pregnancy. Okay. It's not so, common. Uh, normally in your countries, you use dihydrogesterone. Correct. Uh, or progesterone, but uh, in theory, it could be also used. Yes, because of it, it's a progestogen, right? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Um, coming back to a question that we spoke about endometriosis. Uh, once amenorrhea is achieved and there's less dysmenorrhea in mild to moderate endometriosis, can the Dynogest COC be used continuously better than other COCPs? Is there any studies to compare this? Um, no, there is no prospective, randomized, double-blind study done on this. Uh, uh, 
um, clearly why because uh, in all European countries, the COC uh, that are widely used in the management of endometriosis have never been uh, trialed in a clinical trial, honestly, but it can be done. And the point is <clears throat> um, why Dinogest in the combination with atinyl estradiol is often used is this anti-inflammatory effect of the Dinogest molecule. Okay, great. Um, okay, this question is on the using Dinogest in the COC for dysmenorrhea. When we stop the, the uh, COC, how soon do we see the dysmenorrhea or the, is there a, a higher chance of the dysmenorrhea uh, resolving once we stop it? Um, <clears throat> if you, <clears throat> if you stop, um, the woman will, with a high probability, develop again of the bleeding and then the dysmenorrhea. So there is objectively no reason why to do this. Okay. Um, the, the problem is the dysmenorrhea is very often the clinical sign of adenomyosis uteri. And we will not um, solve the adenomyosis uteri. Uh, we will solve the development of the endometrial glands with the hormones. At the moment we stop, the woman more or less will, will get the symptoms. And look, uh, we have, and I also published this data on the recurrency rate of endometriosis after endometriosis specific hormonal treatments without doing nothing. And we know that 70 to 90% of the women develop again the pain symptoms if we are not doing a prolonged continuous treatment. And there is no um, uh, risk situation to do this for a prolonged time. All right. I think because with Asians, the question is always how long do I need to take this medication? You know, yeah. so. uh, open end, as I say. Because uh, the, the point is, if I have a positive um, impact and the, the, again, blockbuster, trombolic events, they occur honestly in the first six months of use. Nothing is impossible, but after month six, the trombolic rate diminishes dramatically. So this risk then is disappeared. And if the woman feels well, and if the woman has no pain, uh, she can use it augment. Okay, all right. Um, now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, is there any contraindication of using uh, COCs and getting vaccinated for the COVID-19 vaccine? Okay. Um, there are different and complex situations that has nothing now to do with, with Dynogest. Um, from the perspective of COVID thinking. First COVID, then vaccination, two different aspects. COVID is an immunothrombotic disease. And this is the reason why thinking on COVID, I should not use estrogens. I should use the progestin only pill, like for example, drosperinone only pill. Um, this is important. If, if, if my mind, if my mind is to think so, uh, because it could be a risk, especially for those who can develop the disease. Second point is um, the Trump embolic risk of the vector-based vaccines. So Sinovac of China, Sputnik of Russia, uh, AstraZeneca is, um, is five times lower, five times lower than the risk of the risky COC. This is important. I have the data of a country like Spain so that you can see the relations. In Spain, five million of people have been vaccinated with AstraZeneca. There were 20 cases of thrombosis and four cases of death. So this is 0 0.0004. And this means this is not a reason why not to use the COC. Okay. 
So I think that answers the question. Um, we we still have an, a little bit more time. Anybody who wants to ask any more questions, otherwise we actually complete all the questions today. Maybe another one minute to for anyone to give any questions. In the meantime, Professor Regidon, would you want to give us your maybe a take home message? Well. Um... I would say that with the introduction of, of Dynagest, um, a, a, a new class molecule has been invented that, that has the ability to, to feature in one uh, pregnant and non-pregnant abilities of the hormonal side, and that it has a highly anti-inflammatory aspect. And these three things make this molecule unique. And this is the, the, the main message. And then independent if I add uh, or not estrogens, but from the, from the non-contraceptive benefit sides, um, if I add an estrogen, I would always use ethinyl estradiol. Okay. So I think we've come to the end. There's no more questions today. So I would like to say danke. Thank you very much, Professor Regidor. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you and much. also, okay. thank, you, thank you to Eurodrug for uh, today's you, session. Yes. Thank you and have a nice evening to Malaysia. Bye bye. Right. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye. Suzanne, can you please put up the holding slide, please? For those who wants to claim your CPD and your CME point, please, uh, you can do so. From, from here. Thank you very much for joining. If you have any uh, questions, you can continue uh, to write here and we can get back to you in the email. Thank you very much again. Uh, so we will just leave this slide over here. Uh, thank you very much for your time. You can lock off from now. And uh, we will also send the list to MMA, NSR and MPS for those who have attended uh, for to register for you to get your, your points, right? Thank you very much indeed and have a very good evening.